so the title of my talk is The Key to Understanding Psychological Processes. And I think the key lies in using measurement intensive um, longitudinal data. And in the next 10 minutes, I will explain you why I think that's the case and also give a few hints on how would you analyze such data. Uh, today's talk is joint work with uh, Tanja Krone, our PhD student, Marike Timmerman, who is co-supervising Tanja with me, and Franske van Apeldoorn, who provided the data. She works at the medical center here. <coughs> and the outline of my talk is threefold. There are three parts, so each is only a couple of minutes. In the first part, I'm going to talk about measurement intensive um, longitudinal data and why it's really important uh, to understand psychological processes. With measurement intensive longitudinal data, I mean data that's measured in time, so repeated measures, but more than just a couple of measurements, not just a pre-treatment measurement, a post-treatment measurement, and maybe one follow-up, but really something like 10 to 20 or maybe 100 measurements in time. The second part is on dynamic models. Very shortly, why are they so useful in analyzing such data? And I will show how they work with an example from clinical psychology. So for starters, um, why should you be worried about longitudinal data when you're a psychologist? Um, there are many reasons. I only have a few minutes, so I only give four of them. I think um, ecological validity in experiments quite often is not as high as you hope. Um, when you do an experiment, you're, of course, able to, do, to take risks. You're not able to take in real life, or at least not willing to take in real life. So that does have some kind of effect. So if you can measure reality directly rather than through some experiment, there's always a bonus in that. A second argument is simply because we can. Um, when uh, Gerard Heimann started the Psychological Institute in 1892, um, he wanted to find empirical evidence for psychological theories. And he had to use very basic methods. It was before the t-test, it was before the p-value, it was before ANOVA and reg regression were discovered, so to say. So he used quite elementary methods and over the years we learned to do smarter things and smarter things. Um, nowadays we have a lot of technical advances uh, like smartphones, smart meters, smart grids, a lot of things that start with smart that will help you to measure things automatically and repeatedly. And they help you to collect these data whereas maybe one or two decades ago it was not really feasible. A third reason is to gain insight in within-person characteristics. It doesn't really matter which area of psychology you're interested in. If you're studying some kind of phenomenon, you can say, okay, maybe depression or something. Why is this group of persons more prone to be depressed than that group of persons? What are the between-person characteristics? But also within a single person, you want to know, okay, this person is depressed, but how depressed is he today? How depressed was he yesterday? Will he be tomorrow? And what caused the change, etc. So you want to find out individual change and that's the underlying process. So rather than the static outcome, is this person depressed or not? Does this person have a certain condition or not? You really want to understand the underlying process. When did the condition start? When is there a way out? Can we uh, treat it? Uh, how does the condition evolve over time, etc. So those are really interesting and uh, important arguments for sometimes or often using longitudinal data. And this fourth point I will also show on basis of an example. I've got two persons here, I hope it's all visible, a red one and a blue one, and they are not real, I created them with my computer. And I just chose, for instance, positive effect. Um, we measured a positive effect uh, on day one, day two and day ten, something like that. And we want to know what kind of pattern is there. And I simulated these persons in such a way that they have exactly the same mean, exactly the same variance, exactly the same trend. So they look to be exactly the same. And you can see it on this picture as well. The blue person has a dip that's slightly larger than the dip of the red person, but more or less the same pattern. And if you take a couple of extra measurements, because you, let me say, uh, do measurements in time, you still don't see a lot. But if you take measurement intensive longitudinal data, so really measure them every day for a couple of months in a row, you get pictures like this. And this is the same data as on this picture, but just more measurements. And now you see a clear distinction between the red person and the blue person in the sense that the red person seems to be more stable over time. If he has a high positive effect today, he's quite likely to have a high positive effect tomorrow. It can be a bit higher, it can be a bit lower, but Today's state and tomorrow's state are quite similar. 
whereas with the blue person, it really jumps all over the place. It's completely unpredictable. It's even uh, so extreme that there's some kind of negative uh, correlation in time. If he's very positive today, he's likely to be negative tomorrow, etc. You can see from these pictures that the average trend over time, it, it's, well, you can see it from this picture even better. It's quite stable, and that's very often the case with uh, psychological constructs like effect that the process itself, if you look at the mean level, it's quite stationary, but the deviations from the mean level are not, and they can be quite different. In this case, you see the red person is, has very different short-term dynamics or an inertia than the blue person. And to find out those short-term dynamics, you really have to have uh, time-intensive measurements. So hopefully in the past few minutes, I was able to show you why those uh, measurement-intensive longitudinal models are really useful in psychology. Then of course the next question is if you have such data, how to analyze them? And you might have guessed it from the title. The best way to do so is with dynamic linear models. It's a very nice broad class of models. It's combining a lot of different statistical and methodolog methodological techniques like state-based models, Bayesian inference, and it stems from econometrics a couple of decades ago. And it was quite an elementary model, but it grew out to be a very versatile class of models. It has um, many advantages, and the only disadvantage is that it's quite technical and difficult to learn, but you can overcome that by learning it. So actually, it only has advantages. <laughs> and on the next slide, I will name a couple of those advantages. Uh, for starters, it's a so-called empirical Bayesian method. And of course, most of you probably all will have heard about the debate between Bayesian statistics and classical statistics, that one side is claiming to be better than the other side. And I think the empirical Bayesian method is actually um, a way to eat the Bayesian omelette without breaking the Bayesian eggs, because you do get all the advantages of Bayesian statistics, like having your inferences in the form of probability distributions. But the main point of criticism towards Bayesian statistics, that it's subjective, doesn't hold so you have the plus, but you don't have the minus. You can't get better than that. Secondly, it's uh, by default, it's multivariate, it's hierarchical. So whatever the structure of your data is, it fits within this dynamic linear model. And of course, as you know, if you have multiple parameters by analyzing them all simultaneously, you gain statistical power. You can be more certain about your inferences. Third reason, uh, it's really flexible. Uh, all the Dutch people in here will know the saying, van Lego kan je alles maken. With Lego bricks you can build anything. And the DLM is really like a box of Lego bricks. Whether you want to build a very simple model or a very difficult model with multivariate structures, a model with, with important short-term dynamics or no short-term dynamics at all, with normal distributions or other things, everything is, possib is possible. So it's really versatile and flexible. A fourth reason, um, missing values. If you have time-intensive uh, longitudinal data, then of course it's very easy to get missing values. Someday maybe your smartphone, the battery ran out and you didn't have your measurement, etc. The more you measure, the more likely it is that at some point you have missing values. But they are not a problem for DLMs. You don't have to resort to external solutions like multiple imputation. It's all already built into the model. And the fifth advantage, it's much faster than uh, conventional time series methods. And it depends a bit on what kind of data you have, but if you have like big data, then of course computing speed becomes really important. So I mentioned some advantages. Let's now s show how this uh, DLM works uh, on the basis of a real example from psychology. It's uh, patients, they are diagnosed with panic disorder um, so they have this disorder, they go to their therapist and um, according to literature there are three golden treatments for it. Either give them some cognitive behavior, give them serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors or a combination of both. And what we did, or I didn't do, Franske did in this study was measure, uh, let the patients measure the number of panic attacks they experience every week for a year, so 52 weeks in a row. The data set consisted of 160 patients and about half of them really provided all 52 meshes and the other half had some missing values. 
um, half as female, half as male roughly, and half had um, suffered also agoraphobia and the other half didn't. So that's inside the data and just, I skipped the slide. If we look uh, at patterns here, um, the picture shows a number of different patients and um, on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, it's the week, the y-axis is the number of panic attacks they had. And what you can see from each patient is they started with a lot of panic attacks, then the treatment kind of kicked in and it goes down. You can see some patients with a lot of missing values, others didn't. And what Tanya did was she built a dynamic model for this, taking into account a lot of different aspects. There was a multi-level structure. We had time within patients, within treatments. You wanted to have some kind of treatment group effect because we wanted to know is one treatment better than, than another or are they really similar. We wanted to have room for individual differences. Some people are just more prone to have a panic attack than others. And also those short-term dynamics, those inertia effects should be in there. Uh, to make things more complicated, the measurement scale was um, frequency. So most people either had zero, one or two panic attacks after a couple of weeks. And then you cannot assume normality. So we had to use the Fasson distribution. And there was a lot of missing data in different structures. It could be incidental and at some points also drop out patients who just said, well, I don't feel like continuing it anymore. We all put it all into a DLM, and this is the main result, uh, the group level. And what you can see here are three colored bands, um, probably not very visible, but in the center of the band there's a black line, that's the prediction, and then some kind of credibility interval around it. On the x-axis, it's still weak number. On the y-axis, it's the expected number of panic attacks per week, thanks. And what you can see is green is lying higher than the other two colors. Green is the cognitive behavioral therapy, so people who only got that therapy um, were expected to have more panic attacks than the other two treatments. So the other two treatments clearly work better. And you can see from the other two treatments, they overlap quite a lot. But the purple one seems to tend to go to zero a bit faster than the, or the other one. So there's a small hint that that one's better. Uh, individual level, we did find that short-term dynamics were really um, important and that there were quite severe individual differences. So to conclude, longitudinal data really holds the key if you want to understand the psychological process than rather than just its outcome. And the DLMs, they are really useful for it. And in the example, we were really able to answer clinical questions that were previously unanswered. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>